heart and speak into our heart because we need him. And we exist for God. Amen. And so this um, semester, we've been going through Ephesians, and we've been moving along. We're still on chapter 1, but we'll finish chapter 1 today. So, um, but we'll drink through uh, each verses, I guess. Um, last week, Pastor Greg went through the apostolic prayer from verse 15. Um, and so today, we're going to just pick up where he left off, because um, toward the end of verse 18 and 19, he's praying that we may know God better, know Jesus better, right? And he's praying that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that we may know three things. Remember that? We may know the hope of God's calling, that we may know the riches of his inheritance, and lastly, we may know the, his incomparable um, power for those who believe. So today we want to unpack the power which goes through verses 19 to 23. So we want to kind of reflect on that today. Is it okay? Because uh, many of you, you look like you need more power. Uh, you look powerless. And uh, maybe it's the uh, midterm week. But, you know, it's not just physically. But I know many of us, we struggle because you feel spiritually weak. You feel powerless. And some of us, we try, we're just surviving and inside, we feel like, God, why am I so weak? I am dying. Um, I'm going through religious motion, but there is no, no life. There's no joy. There's no power. God, what do I do? Well, let's come to God today. Amen. Um, you know, actually, these days, there's a thought that's been really helping me a lot, which is this. Say with me, I am. Just a servant. Amen. We exist to serve God and no more. Our aim is not for us to be heroes, to be great. Only God is great. He is great God and we exist to know him and to serve him. Sometimes I think we become powerless and we feel tired because we feel like we need to be God's. And we tell God what to do. And he doesn't do what we tell him to do. We exist for him. But I, I think today we want to come before him and lay down our life before him and say, Lord, make us all that we're supposed to be for you, God. Amen. Not for our agenda, not for our glory. But Lord, that we will live for you. We would know you, God. And we cannot know God apart from God's power. Amen. We can't serve God without his grace. Not for our own goodness, not for our own strength, not for our own glory. But Lord, we want to give our life for you. So we need you to fill us with your word, your heart, with your life, with your power, so that we might become everything that you want us to be for your glory, because we exist for God. Amen. So let us come to God, humbly depending on God, because there, there is no other option. Amen. Okay? So, today we want to just unpack, I think just verse 18 and 19. Um, so that we might receive and experience God's power for your life. Amen. Do you want that? Yeah? Then we got to pray, right? Because this is prayer. So, if you could look at, um, yeah, next slide. Well, let's read verse 18 and 19. Let's read it together. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Okay. And let's stop there. Well, the power is like the working of mighty strength. Amen. So next slide. So I just want to say two things today that we may know the power. Okay, that's the first thing. And that we may know what the power is. That's not the second thing. So we may know the power. As we look at the flow, Lord, I need the experience. I need to know the, the power of God in my life. And what does, what does Paul do? Right away, he begins with praise. Verse 3 and on, right? After he says hello, he goes on praising God. 
And his prayer from verse 15 flows from the praise. Praise is first. Amen. We begin by looking toward God, not looking toward me. You want power? It's not in you. It's in God. You want hope? You want wisdom? It's not here. It's in God. Our faith is not religion. Religion says, I look at me, my effort, my goodness, my achievement. Our faith is in the gospel. It's what God has done. It's who he is. It's what he accomplishes. It's his commitment. It's his achievement. It's his power for us who trust in God. Amen. So our attitude is not looking at me and my agenda and be a victim and complaining. Our eye is, is on him. You are the Savior. You've done marvelous things. And we begin to praise him. We start by looking at God. And the gospel is about God's beauty, his love, his accomplishments, his goodness, his power. So Paul begins from verse 3. To 14, just one long sentence of glorious praise. We begin with him. We look at him. Oh, praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He has called us to be blameless and holy before in his sight. Before the foundation of the world, he's chosen us. He predestined us to be adopted as, as his sons. Not because of anything in us but because of his own glory, his own purpose, his own wisdom. And we begin to look at God and wonder and be amazed and enter into, get out from my own little life and enter into who God is and who God is for us. Amen. We start by looking at God. We praise him. You know, some people, you pray a lot, but you don't praise. That's no good. (laughs) We praise God for what he is, what he has done, who he is. Amen? And praise changes our perspective. Praise completes our joy. Praise transforms the the direction of our lives because God is God. And I begin to reorient my life to greatness of God and the purposes of God. Right? So we praise. But if you praise, then that leads you into right prayer. Our prayer becomes intelligent. You don't just pray, Lord, give me more money, give me girlfriends. You don't, you don't pray that dumb prayers. It becomes intelligent prayer. Your prayer flows from what God is doing, who he is. And so well, what's the prayer? Well, praise is we praise Jesus. We praise Jesus for what he has done for us, who he is to us, his greatness. All the spiritual gift in Christ, Amen. And what's the prayer? Prayer is that we may know Jesus better. It's a God-centered prayer. It's biblical prayer. It's prayer full of life and the prayer according to his will and the prayer that God wants to answer. Amen. So Lord, I praise you. And my prayer is that I would know you better. That's the prayer. My prayer is that I would know all that you have already given us. Amen. That's the prayer. Prayer here is not for hope. He's not praying for hope. He's not praying for riches of inheritance. He's not praying for power. He's praying for the knowledge of the hope that we already have. There's a real difference. Because God has given us hope in Christ. He has given us his son. We have the son. We have life. He has given us inheritance. He has given us the power. He has given us the spirit. He has given us the sonship. He has given us the new heart. Amen. He has given us, but we don't know it. So he's not praying, give us different hope or more hope. He's praying that may we know. He's praying for knowledge. He's praying for wisdom. What you really, really, really need in your life It's not more money. It's not for you to be handsomer. That will not help. (laughs) Sorry, sunshine. (laughs) My son. What we really need is wisdom. You know what your problem is? 
you know what my problem is? Fundamentally, I need to know Jesus better. Underneath all my problem, at the, at, at the essence of it all, I need to know Jesus better and all that he is and all that he has done for me and all that he is to me. Amen? That's the foundational need. I need to know God better. I need to know this hope. When he called me, all that in, encompasses so that I would know it and experience it. We need wisdom. That's what John, remember James 1? What you really need in the time of struggle and testing and, and the struggle? We need to ask God for wisdom. That's what we need. We need to know what we need, knowledge. Amen. So three things about this knowledge. He's praying for the things that he already has. Hmm? I went to um, Vancouver a couple of weeks ago. And um, my mother-in-law needed this computer cord or something. And I said, okay. And we went to four different stores. We went to Best Buy, Future Shop, uh, I mean, you know, Canadian Tire. I mean, we, and we couldn't find one. And me and my brother-in-law, we, we, we drove around, we couldn't find it. At the end, I, I found out two days later, it was in my bag. I had it all along. Right? I mean, it was, it was here all along. Hmm? I mean, I have tons of stories like that. I had it. I had it. You know, if some of you says, you know, say to me, young ho, you know, I hear there's a, there are really cute little kids in Seoul. Let's go see them. The cutest kids in the world, they're my house. I mean, really, it's true. Cuter than sunshine. I don't have to go to Seoul to see the cutest kids. They're in my house. I see them every day. They're my treasure, right? Let's go meet the most beautiful woman in the world in Paris. She's in my house. I married her. Right? I mean, let's find a great friend somewhere. She's my wife. <laughs> if, you, if I need a great friend, I need to get to know her better. That's all. Friends, our hope is not out there. Our strength, our power is not out there. It's in Jesus. What more can God give you? He's given you the sun. He's given you his heart. He's given you his life. He's given you the destiny. He's given you the spirit of God. What more do you need out there? It's in Christ. So the question is not I need something more and different. What I need is I need to know what he's given me already. Amen? Yeah? Like Professor Jumo, he calls me, he says, hey, do you know any cellist these days? If you know him, he's married to a world-class cellist. You eat with her every day. You ask her, right? It's here. Amen? You know, the problem is that we don't know as we think we know. Do you know the power in your life? We don't know. It's yours. You don't know it. Do you know the hope that you have? We know, but we don't know. That's the problem. Do you know the inheritance? And the you know, do you know that if you are in Christ, you are the happiest person in the world? Do you know that? You don't know. I mean, you know, but you don't know. And his prayer, God, I don't pray for more of other stuff. I don't pray for the world. I pray that I would know that I know that I know that I know what you have given me. That's my greatest need. Amen. You know, word know in Bible, it's, it's well, English is kind of wimpy because you say, I know that, and it could mean informational knowing. It's kind of like English, like word hope we talked about last time. Word in the Bible, no, it's much richer than English, no. You know, like you could say, yeah, I know Handong. I googled Handong. You could read about the 갈대 상자. You read it, you know, yeah, I know Handong. But you don't know Handong until you know Handong. I've been here for over 12 years, and I'm beginning to know Handong. I'm experiencing Handong. I, I eat in Handong, and I eat in Handong, and I eat in Handong. I, I love Handong, and I hate Handong, and I love Handong. You know, because knowing in the Bible is not just informational, but it's 
experiential, it's emotional. That's why he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you really know what you have. Amen. So you really experience it. It, it, It's to your life that you know. Hmm? I mean, I heard about a a guy. He was walking in 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 the winter. He was walking across the lake that was frozen. And he knew, he heard that you could walk across this. But he was, he knew, he, he heard, he, he, he knew, but he wasn't sure. He didn't know. He believed, but he didn't know. So he was walking very carefully like this. And then he wasn't sure, so he was on his forward. And he was like, okay, okay. And then he heard this noise, like loud noise. He looked back and there was a, like a carriage of you know, six horses rushing down the lake, passing by him. How embarrassing. I mean, he, he knew, but he didn't know. But the carriage people, they do this every day. They know. They, it's, it's, they know. Yeah? I hope my kids, you know, when they wake up in the morning, you know, they don't say, oh, Mr. Huang. I know that you're my daddy, but uh, I'm not sure. I, can you please give me something to eat, please? Oh, I mean, I want them to know. You know, wake up, daddy! (laughs) Give me a kiss. I'm hungry now. Give me food now, daddy. Gogi, now. I mean, I like that better because they know they're, uh, you know, sometimes I ask my children, you know, I love you. They're like, yeah, yeah. I, I, did I, didn't I say this? I, I asked my daughter, you know you're really beautiful? She goes, I know. <laughs> How do you know you're beautiful? Because you told me. Right? I mean, and uh, how do you? <clears throat> Listen, our power in Christ, it's one thing to just have con- conceptual. We've come today and we're praying to God that we would live it. We would know it. We would live in God's grace. Amen? Amen? Because the knowledge is not something that we have it in our head. It's something that we enter into. Um, I guess my, my daughter, she's seven now, and she's becoming like a teenager all of a sudden. It's, really, it's like she has headphones on all the time now. <laughs> there's there's the one particular song that she listens to over and over. She sings it. I mean, if you find a good music, why do you listen to it over and over? I mean, you listen to it once. That's, that's good, right? Good music, it's not so that you, you heard it once, you know it. No, because it's good, you enter into it. Right? When I was in high school, I discovered, you know, Walkman back then. <laughs> it's a different world. You put this on, it's a different world. You, are, you enter into it. Right? When you look at the sunset, every time you see it, it amazes you. And you sit before it, you enter into it. You experience it. Hmm? He's, he prays, the, I pray the eyes of your heart will be opened. And, and the word here is perfect tense. It means it's continual. Not only you ent- you, you, you're amazed once, but you're amazed again and again and again. Amen. I'm still amazed at my kids. I see them every day. I'm, I still get amazed. Hmm? I still get amazed at my wife. Hi, who are you again? Like, I can't believe you're my wife. We enter it. So this experience is not just, yeah, I know it, but it's always wondrous. It's always bigger than us. And we enter into God's love, his power, his, his word, his wisdom, and what he has done for me, and what he is doing in me and for me, and every day we enter in. That's why you are so weak, because you've been out. We need to get in and stay. Because, you know, when I'm with God, when I'm in his word, when I'm in connection with God, I'm different. My world is different. My emotions are different. My desires are different. The way I view the world is different with God. When I come out from God, when I'm selfish, when I ignore God, I'm connected to a different world. 
different mentality, different desires, different emotion, different identity. Don't you know that? Apart from God, we can do nothing. Apart from God, we die spiritually. Apart from God, we are weak. Amen. We are meant to live in God continually. We're meant to be in connection with God continually. So I pray the eyes of your heart may be open continually to the promises and to the presence and to the power and to the grace, continual provision of God so that I say I am what I am by the grace of God. And that grace was not without effect. No, it is his power inside. I work harder than all of them. But not I, but the grace of God that is with me and in me and for me. Amen. So this is our prayer today. That we may continually know the love of God. The power of God. The provision of God. The wonder of God. The identity in God. The sonship of God. May we continually to know who God is and what he does for me. May we repent back to God. Amen? Amen? You know, I don't remember when I first ate meat, but it must have been fantastic. What is this? After eating all the, you know, baby food. I mean, what is this? Meat. Every time I eat meat, it's amazing. <laughs> I repent back to it. Every time I eat food, it's amazing. But if I don't eat, I become weak. We're meant to live on Christ, his word, his life. We breathe in his presence. Amen. Anyway, so say with me, may we know. May we really know. May we truly know. May we continually know God's power. Amen. So no wonder you're weak. You can't be strong apart from God. Come and let's wait upon the Lord. Amen. So what, what is this power? Number two, what is this power? Say with me. He is in comparably great power. That's what we want to know. And this power is for those who believe. Amen. This power is, the, the, God has given us this power, but this power is for who believe. Why? Because God doesn't give you power be honest, he gives you himself. Amen. So this power is God's power for those who trust and look to God. Yeah? Sounds good? I mean, if, if I believe, power for those who believe, I believe in Pastor Greg because he said he'll do something for me. He'll carry the piano for me because I can't. He's strong and, and I'm lazy, right? And I believed. He said, well, what's, where's the power that will bring the piano up? It's power of Pastor Greg. Right? It's power for those who look to God. It's God. It's God's power, right? I mean, I, mean, I used to play basketball. Uh, I haven't played basketball in a long time because I want to be healthy. Because uh, I noticed that after a certain age, it's healthier not to play sports. Because I saw all these professors hobbling around and their broken leg and pulled hamstrings, you know. Right? Because I want to be able to, I mean, but imagine if I play two-on-two -two basketball tournament. Right? And LeBron James called me and says, yo, P.Y., I want to play with you. I want to play for you. I'm going to win the whole tournament. I could say with utter confidence, in Handong, we will beat every team here. Amen. Right? It's powerful. Those, you know why I believe that we will beat everyone, including Pastor Greg's team? Do you know why? Because LeBron James could beat any team by himself. I know that. I just got to pass the ball. <laughs> Yo, LeBron here. So when we say power of God for who, those who believe, it's those who trust God, those who look to him, we're really talking about God's power for us, for me, in me. That's the power. That's, it, my power versus God's power, incomparable. World's power, God's power, no comparison. Satan's power, God's power. 
no comparison, not even close. This power of God is for those who look to God, trust God. Amen? This word, who believe, this faith is a relational word. It's a relational word. This is what I mean. You know, I've been picking up on Professor Amos today. Hi, Amos. If somebody comes to you in the middle of the street, right, and this person comes to you and says, Professor Amos, yes. I believe that you are a professor. That doesn't mean much. I believe that you are a person. Why? Thank you. Yeah. But if this person comes and says, I trust you for my tuition this semester. That's very dangerous belief. I trust you to feed me and clothe me and meet my emotional need forever. Will you allow him to believe such thing? That's weird, right? I mean, because now we're talking about your belief has to do with this certain relationship you have to have, right? But what if it was y e g a who said that? Daddy, I trust you that you'll pay my tuition. Good. I trust you, you're going to feed me, you're going to dress me, and you're going to meet my emotional need. Good. It's that kind of relationship. When we say we believe in God's power, provision, what we're saying is, God, I come to you because I trust you to take care of my destiny. Good. I trust you for your power to change my life and change my heart and, and put your spirit in me and enable me to know you and love you and, and, and to grow in your word. Good. I trust you to take care of my emotional need and physical need. And direct my path. Good. God, you are the Lord and the master of my life. And I surrender. I entrust my entire life to you. God says, good. It's that kind of relationship. I allow you to trust me. In fact, I want you to trust me. In fact, I demand it. Because you are mine. And I am yours. We have a covenantal relationship of faith and grace and hope and trust. That's The gospel. Amen. So there is a great power for those who have this relationship. Amen. So my son says, hey, listen, everybody. He's five years old. Where I'm going to go to the United States this summer. Do you have money? No. Do you know how to drive? No. Do you know how to get to the train station? No. What do you know? My daddy told me. That's enough. Because daddy has money. A little bit. Daddy knows how to take the bus. <laughs> right? He's relying on this power. Amen? So this power is for those who believe and has to do with special relationship. Yeah? Amen? So uh, uh, Pastor Greg quoted Isaiah 40, 31. Right? For those who wait upon the Lord, those who look to the Lord, those who seek Him and look for Him, God will give you strength, His strength. Amen? You will soar on the wings of eagle. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. God will help you. And you will experience God. So today, may we know, and for those who look to God, We come to his service today, and, and today we want to just wait upon the Lord. God, it's you. It's not me. I wait for you to speak to me and, and carry me, Lord, because I am weak and broken apart from you. I wait for you. Amen. Sounds good? Just want to just cover one more thing. That, well, two more things. This power is God's power in us. Say it with me. God's power in me. Because what's the greatest need of my life is that I may know Jesus better. Amen. And I can't know Jesus apart from the power of God in me to reveal Christ, to give me wisdom and understanding so that I may want him, love him, desire him, understand him, and to know him. Amen. It's a miracle, God. Friends, 
if you believe in Jesus? It's not, of course I believe in Jesus. It is, it's amazing that I become his. Amen. I can't believe that I believe that I believe, but I believe. Wow. In fact, the literal translation of verse 19, literal translation is this. Um, his great, uh, his incom super in incomparable great power for us who believe according to the strength of his might. Amen. There is the word kata. And I think I saw it in Spanish. De fuerza or something. I saw that word. And that's very important. Because, because this incomparable power for us who believe according to the power that's in work with us, the resurrection power. Amen. It means even the very faith that we have. It's a gift of God. Our faith is not a gift to God. Our faith is not our gift to God. Our faith is God's gift to me. Me going to God and says, I trust you with my life. I trust you with my sin. I trust you with my baggage. It's not my gift to God. It's God's gift to me. God calls Abraham. God calls David. God calls Moses and says, come follow me. Right? And God trains them. It's God's grace that we trust God. Amen? A few verses later, we're going to look next week. What's our spiritual condition? You were dead in your sins and transgressions in which you used to live. When you were enslaved, you, were, you followed the ways of this world. You were enslaved by the spirit of the kingdom of the ruler of the air. And you were gratifying the cravings of your sinful nature. You are by nature objects of wrath. Romans 1, 18 and on. No one seeks God. No one wants God. Not even one is righteous. Amen. And what is the gospel? Verse 4 of Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made you alive when you were dead. Amen. Your faith is a fruit of God's saving, regenerating grace. Amen. I believe because God gave me new birth. He says to Nicodemus, you cannot even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again, born of the Spirit. So God, the greatest issue is not out there. The greatest enemy is inside. It's me. There's something in me. That I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to seek you. I don't want to love you. I don't want to acknowledge you. There's something in me. But this great power of God, super megaton power, is the power that works in my heart to convict me, to teach me, to enlighten me, to, to draw me out, to show me Christ and show me my sin. Amen? It's the illuminating, convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit so that I could go, go to God and say, God, I trust you and not me because you are the Savior. And this power is in work in your life. Amen. So we need to pray for this power. Right? That's why Hebrew 12. So, friends, you don't boast about your faith. When you, if you really want to boast about your faith, you boast in Christ the object of your faith, the boasting of your faith. That's why Hebrew 12 says what? We fix our eyes on Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Amen? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross so that we might trust him, we might know him. He is the so he, one who began a good work in you, if Philippians 1 says, he will complete it. Until the day of Christ. So we boast in Christ. He's my foundation. He's my joy. He's my strength. He's my hope. We look to him. Sounds good? Amen. So this power in us, what kind of, so what kind of power is in us? Answer, power of resurrection. What is the greatest power the man has ever known? It seems like death, isn't it? Nuclear bomb, hurricane, earthquake, cancer, and no one could overcome that. Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Hitler, they may conquer land and nations, but at the end they all die, fertilizing the ground. 
power of death seems absolute. But power of resurrection, now that's power. Which is easier, to kill or to give life? That's the power of God working in you. Amen. When, when, when we read about power, we're thinking about like X-Men. <laughs> oh, I don't know, like the flying. I mean, that's not power. The real power. It's, 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 it's God's power able to take sinner, make them into saints. People who hated God, make them into lovers of God. The real power is make people who, who are enemies, make them into sons and daughters of God. People who now look like Jesus, love Jesus, have his heart, his mind, power of life and resurrection. That's power. And that's power working in me by the grace of God. It doesn't seem fantastic, but it's real and it lasts for all eternity. All eternity we will worship God and I will sit next to him, sit on the throne. Amen. That's power. Life is power. I mean... My kids grow up, and it's just amazing. Life is power. Remember 1 Kings 19? God says, I'm going to reveal my presence to you. I'm going to show you my glory. And there was a hurricane. But the Lord was not in it. There was an earthquake. The Lord is not in it. There was a fire, volcano. The Lord is not there. And then... A gentle whisper. The Lord is there. His love, his voice to save, to restore Elijah. Speak life into him. To bring salvation. God's power. Gospel is the power of God for salvation. For all who would have this trust, love relationship with God. And that's the power. Amen. It doesn't seem as impressive as the wind or the fire earthquake, but it's the most impressive because it will take people from all different nations to be sons and daughters of God forever. Defeating power of sin and death and Satan and hell. That's the power working in you as you speak and as you live today in his presence. Amen? Yeah? I want to close with this. Not only this is power for in us, God's power is God's power on behalf for us. Say with me, God's power for us, for me. You know, Paul is trying to use all different words to say how big this power is. He uses it on incomparably great power. You know what those three words are? It means super megaton dynamite. Okay, in Greek, that's why it is, literally it says super megaton dynamite. To save you, for you, not to destroy you. Amen. <laughs> kind of like an illustration. Let's imagine. Imagine. Hi, Hyunjin. There you are. Imagine Hyunjin. Uh, he's a slave in this little tribal island because his parents sold him for money or something. I don't know. So he is miserable, a slave in this little island with people like Sunshine going honga bonga. And, and you know. And he is miserable. He says, oh, he's miserable. Right? And let's say if, you know, in this little cell, he has, he has a friend, Joe, Joseph there. And Joseph says, Hijun, what are you feeling? And Hijun says, I want to get out of here. I want to be free. And I want to go to the United States. In fact, I want to study in university. I want to go to England, in fact, and study in Oxford. And I want to be somebody. And just let me out of here. And here's, here's Joseph, he heard that. Meta was there. What's the Meta? She was there. And, and, and she heard it. And so Joseph says to Hijun, Hijun, I want to help you. So next day, Joseph brings him a little coconut. Have a drink and have a good day. I mean, why? That, that's the limit of his power, a coconut. <laughs> Enjoy, drink. Imagine you're in England or something, I don't know. Now, Meta says to Hyunjin, Meta says, I could help you. Trust me. Okay. Three days later, 20 fleet 
of Navy ships come. Where 30,000 troops land on the island and break down the cell, who walks in? President Obama walks in. Oh, you must be Hujun. Come, we'll take care of you. Are you okay? Let me get you something to drink. Flies him over to the United States. Give him a mansion. Flies him over to England. The Queen of England meets him. President of the Oxford comes in. I want you to come and study in my university. I will tutor you personally. Now, I'm, like, this is outrageous, I know. And then the question is, who is Meta? I mean, what sort of power is at work here? But you know, the kind of scenario, I am trying to be as ridiculous as I can because the gospel is more ridiculous. In order to save us, God himself became a man, walked through the dirty street, was hungry and beaten. He went to the cross, executed for me. God of the universe, whole cosmos, he was resurrected for me. Amen? God shaped the whole entire cosmos. They're in hold because they're waiting for sons of God to be revealed. I mean, it's just ridiculous how God values us. Ridiculous. You know, he says here, the power is like the power of resurrection. Why was Jesus raised? Not for him, but for you. Did you hear that? Say with me, for me, for us. He was not resurrected for him. He was resurrected for you because he didn't even have to die for him. He died for you, for you, for me, yeah. For us? He is seated at the right hand of God. I mean, come on. That was his all along. I mean, what's the big deal? He is God. Well, you know why that's the big deal? Because he was sitting at the right hand of God for us as our in head, as our representative. You understand? He's not sitting at the right hand of God as him. He's sitting at the right hand of God as our head. To represent you, his people, so that we could sit with him. The whole drama was for you, for the church. Too big, I know, too unbelievable. I know, but it's true. He, he brings, he rules over all things, absolute, everything under the control of Jesus, right? For what? I mean, he already had that control. But it's significant because he... He put every authority, every power under his feet for the church. That's the point. For you. Do you know how incomparable, super duper, megaton, dynamite power and authority has been working so that you and I could be sons and daughters of God sitting with Jesus forever and ever? All creation is waiting for us. All creation will be renewed so that we will rule and reign with Christ. Do you know that? It's too big, but it's true. And may we begin to know it. May we begin to enter into it and pray into it, yeah? Amen? Uh, I mean, there's a last verse, 28, that says, the church is the fullness of him, fulfills everything in every way. What in the world does that mean? I mean, most commentators... They lean, they, they go back and forth from two options. Maybe three, but I'm just going to talk about two. Most commentators, they say, it could mean unbelievable, but the church is the fullness of Christ. Namely, we complete Christ, which sounds almost heretical. Because God doesn't need us. Right? He doesn't need us. But God amazingly arranged his life and the cosmos in such a way that he became the bridegroom of the bride. And the bride completes the bridegroom. He somehow commits himself in such a way that God becomes our father. And of course, father is not complete without the children. He commits himself in such a way he is the head, and of course, head is incomplete without the body. In some mysterious way, the independent God, who, God who does not need anything, he 
related to us, committed himself to us in such a way that we actually become his treasure in the sense that we become fullness of him. That's how worthy the church is. Don't mock the church. Amen? Praise God that we are part of the church, yeah? And of course, another interpretation, and it's also very theologically correct, is that Christ is the fullness of the church. It's not the programs or the money or the little little get-togethers, but it's Christ himself, his word, his life, his wisdom, his spirit. He is the fullness of our lives. He is our treasure. Maybe if you hold on those two things, we'll begin to understand the power, greatness of power that God made us his treasure. Now God is our treasure. God is our power. Amen? Now, my prayer is that we would know it, really. We would know it continually. We would live as his people. Let's pray together.